I want to thank you all for being here. My dad taught us that when a situation seems hopeless, you're the hope. And today, you are our hope. And um, when everything looks dark, you're the light. You must be the light, and you are the light for us. And that's the first lesson I want to share with you. Dad taught us a lot about every stage of life, from birth to this recent period that he called shooting on through. Um, he was a philosopher, and we need his teachings now more than ever. So I'm going to honor my dad just by sharing a few lessons that I call from his life. Lesson two, spoil children with love and wisdom, not with things. When we were kids, dad would take us places, not like baseball games or ski trips or the Virgin Islands, uh, but you know, conferences on reconstructive knowledge uh, or uh, political conventions or civil rights marches. Once he took me with, to, with him to Kenyon College where he debated a human being named Midge Dector. And uh, she said something uh, that I'll never forget about how my dad's friend, Dr. Spock, had spoiled the children of the 1960s, and these spoiled children were now America's liberals taking over. And, and dad said, no, they were liberals because they loved freedom. And he said, but yes, I agree. I am absolutely for spoiling children, spoiling them with love, the only thing that works to raise healthy adults, he said. And he said, and he said it never occurred to me to spoil them with money because I never had any. Um, and no, it doesn't sound like a very good idea either. Uh, my dad delighted in children, and he saw the best in them. He saw qualities in us we could not see ourselves, and he nurtured them until we did see them, and they became part of us. He loved us unconditionally, and he dreamed for us boundlessly. He was a famously subversive grandfather. Um, he and Lynn once called for a pizza slumber party with a mass of grandchildren whose average age I estimate to be around eight. And after Lynn went to sleep, he let them watch without any parental permission or consent form or anything, uh, wedding crashers. And when all the parents were in an uproar the next day, he led an intergenerational insurrection and debate, rallying the kids to argue that there is no such thing as a bad word. Um, uh, Dad uh, transmitted his natural anarchism to their generation. Uh, take the case of Tommy Raskin, the middle child belonging to Sarah and me, who actually interned with Baba, knowing that was his best chance to spend some time with him. And uh, when he was 10, a boy in our neighborhood got suspended from school for a few days. And the following Monday, we were walking to school, and then we saw this kid walking to school. And I said, Tommy, look, there's Julian. They let him out of jail. And Tommy said, no, they let him back into jail, okay? <laughs> and I don't know whether that's nature or nurture, but Marcus Raskin lives. Uh, lesson three, whatever the background noise is, follow the music in your head and the dreams in your heart. Dad was born in 1934, the year that Hitler declared himself the absolute dictator of Germany. And while my dad's older brother, Uncle Mel, went and fought with valor in World War II and flew bombing missions over Germany, dad was in fifth grade. And every day, the piano prodigy would march off to Whitefish Bay Elementary School. And when the teacher spoke, he couldn't hear them at all. He literally couldn't hear them. He could hear only Bach and Schumann and Beethoven and Chopin playing in his head all day. It was as, as if this little boy was keeping the romantic dreams of the 19th century alive in his mind as the 20th century became drenched in blood and genocide. And when I was a kid, I asked my dad if the teachers sounded to him like the teachers in the Charlie Brown TV show. Wah, 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 wah. But he said no, he couldn't hear anything at all. <laughs> Nothing, just the music playing in his head. And when he turned 16, he left his home in Whitefish Bay, which even by then he was calling White Folks Bay. Um, and, and he said goodbye to his parents, uh, Benjamin, after whom I'm named, the plumber, and my grandmother, Anna, the seamstress, and to his favorite childhood chum, Jerry Silverman, who would leave Whitefish Bay soon thereafter himself and change his name to Gene Wilder. And my dad 
followed the music in his head to New York City to study piano at Juilliard. And there, he befriended another young comic, his roommate, Nipsey Russell. It was as if my dad, who felt the tragic weight of history in his bones, always had to have a comedian on his side, like Gene Wilder, or Nipsey Russell, or later Dick Gregory, a man he loved. Someone who could level the conceits of power with clowning and laughter. Dad loved to laugh, and he never surrendered his absolutely juvenile sense of humor, uh, which you can blame on Willy Wonka. Um, after a year, Dad decided against the urgings of his piano teacher, Rosina Levine, to leave the path of professional music and to study at the University of Chicago. He later told the press he was simply too lazy to pursue music, but that's an unlikely story for a man who never took a single day's vacation in his life. At least vacation in the sense that you would think of it where you actually stop working. For my dad, work and play were fused every moment of every day, and the harder he worked, the more playful he got. He did not even stop working in the hospital when he got sick with something serious, but insisted on wearing regular street clothes. Well, regular for him. Uh, and uh, his hospital room always ended up looking just like his office with books and papers and pink phone messages all over the place. No, it was not laziness. At the time of Joe McCarthy and fallout shelters, Jim Crow here in downtown Washington and apartheid in Johannesburg and Mississippi, the teenage Marcus Raskin decided against a career in classical music because I think he heard something else playing in his head now. The music of a new political language that he would come to help develop and express the language of what they called the civilizing movements of the second half of the 20th century. The civil rights movement, the peace movement in Sane Freeze, the movement for human rights and international law, the labor movement, the women's movement, the LGBT movement, the movement for environmental justice and the movement for immigrant rights, all the movements for human liberation and dignity, freedom and peace that would become his lifeblood and the driving spirit of his beloved IPS and the humanistic counterpoint to a century of war and oppression. The musical contributions here today are a sampler of the music in his head and the dreams in his heart, both the classical pieces that stirred his boyhood imagination and the music of the civilizing movements that infused his passion for freedom. Lesson four, go to school to teach as well as to learn and never let your schooling interfere with your education. A high school friend of my father's wrote me to say that the other kids used to take notes in class when my dad spoke. I, I treasure that one. Um, in college, he taught a kid on his floor named Philip Glass how to play the piano, which some people say explains everything you need to know about Philip Glass's music. Um, um, In law school, Dad was research assistant for Quincy Wright, the professor who advised the judges at the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal. Dad wanted to figure out, in the aftermath of Auschwitz and Treblinka, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, how international law could be used to prevent genocide and war crimes and end what he called the war system. Now think of this for a second. My dad went to law school for a reason, okay? He had a purpose for going. He didn't care about most of his classes, and let's be honest, and kids, cover your ears now, he didn't go to most of his classes. Indeed, when he received an alumni award from Chicago, we learned that his corporation's professor, who practiced the Socratic method, would actually call on my dad at the start of every single class in order to get a big laugh out of everybody else in the room because they knew he wouldn't be there. Um, Dad's uh, selective approach for going to classes did no wonders for his GPA, and he proudly graduated last in his class of more than 600. He had, he had gone to law school for a different reason, to solve a problem, how to use law to prevent the recurrence of war and genocide. Lesson five, bring your full... Bring your full intelligence and ethics to work with you every day, and if you can't, you may need to find a new job. Um, when President Kennedy took office in 1961, Dad left the Hill to join 
McGeorge Bundy as his assistant um, for national security and disarmament. He'd been recommended by Harvard professor David Reisman, who promised the 26-year-old Raskin would become the conscience of the Kennedy team. Upon meeting him, as recorded in The Color of Truth by Kai Bird, who's here today someplace, um, in, in, as recorded in his book, The Biography of the Bundy Brothers, Bundy took to my dad immediately, writing to thank Reisman for the referral. Quote, he has a remarkably powerful and lively mind, and it is flanked by extraordinary moral and physical energy, Bundy wrote. I think we shall probably have some disagreements. Well, <laughs> the, the disagreements came right away. In fact, on his first day of work, as uh, Cy said, I think Bob talked about it, April 19, 1961, the day of the Bay of Pigs, my dad quickly prepared a memo for President Kennedy saying the military base at Guantanamo Bay should be closed and converted into a hospital and given to the people of Cuba as a gift from the American people. The, um, and the, the memo remains unanswered to this day. In, in 1962, dad represented the US at disarmament talks with the Soviet Union in Geneva where he pressed for negotiation of the first atmospheric test ban treaty that would come to pass within a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis. While he was in Geneva, Republican Senator Barry Goldwater and other conservatives attacked the Liberal Papers, a book my dad had edited while working on the Hill. And Bundy wrote JFK a memo to alert him that dad had come under fire for his liberalism, but that he wanted to keep him on. And he wrote, quote, that young menace, Marcus Raskin, has returned from Geneva. You may be curious about Raskin, who's been a good staff officer in spite of and perhaps because of his insistent effort to find ways of making progress in the most unpromising field of arms control and disarmament. He warned the president that, quote, critics of the liberal papers may be trying to focus attention on Raskin, and, and in that event, we can expect a small fuss. Well, dad survived that small fuss, but his criticism of the Vietnam War proved to be too much for Bundy. He was sent to the Bureau of the Budget to work on education, where he promptly moved to block nuclear fallout shelter drills in public schools, and, and, and to press for massive funding of schools in poor communities. Observe Kai Bird, um, whose book tells the story of how the best and the brightest plunged America into the Vietnam War. Quote, for McGeorge Bundy, it may well have been a tragedy that this troublesome 26-year-old was no longer by his side to serve as his conscience. By the end of 1962, Dad had left the administration to create IPS. But he used that episode to teach us something important about power and conscience. When Reisman said my dad would become the conscience of the Kennedy administration, Bundy adopted that tagline and introduced him to everyone, everyone as the conscience of the White House, a putative compliment which my dad completely and vehemently rejected. As he said, if he was going to be their conscience, then what would happen to their conscience? It would atrophy and shrivel away. Outsourcing your conscience is an alibi for irresponsible decision making. If he was going to be assigned the role of conscience in the White House, he said he would never have any power and they would never have any qualms. So never allow yourself to become someone else's conscience, he said. All of us must exercise conscience together and all of us must exercise power together. In democracy, he said, the highest office is that of citizen, and we must bring all of our faculties to the task. <laughs> Lesson six, like FDR, hate war and work as citizens for peace and justice. He was a leader in the movement to stop the Vietnam War, the crucible where he shaped both his intellectual authority and his fierce political and moral courage. The book he wrote with the late distinguished Bernard Fall, who lost his life in Vietnam, called The Vietnam Reader, um, became the Bible of the peace movement, which used it to organize thousands of teach-ins across America. Now imagine that back in 1965. A book about foreign policy designed not for the establishment, but for the people. Like Tom Paine's Common Sense, it was a popular book that galvanized a movement. It did so not as a polemic, but as a reader, a collection of essays from pro and anti-war voices alike, official sources and historical documents, as well as the voices of soldiers and civilians, the underdog soldiers of the night and the armed, unarmed refugees in flight. In 1967, several months after he drafted a call to resist, he was indicted in the Boston Five case 
with Dr. Spock, William Sloan Coffin, Michael Ferber, and Mitchell Goodman for conspiracy to aid and abet draft evasion. They faced many years in prison. I was four, Erica was eight, Noah was four months old, and dad was acquitted, and everyone always wondered why. So finally, for the first time in my life, I just read the whole trial transcript. And what strikes me is that dad never once adopted the stance of a civil disobedient. He never struck the pose of Thoreau. When he accompanied a delegation to the Department of Justice for a draft card turn-in, he actually disagreed with the group, which was insisting that the DOJ officials accept the draft cards of young anti-war protesters as evidence of a crime. Dad said the crime was the war itself, and DOJ should leave the draft resistors alone and immediately launch an inquiry into war crimes taking place in Vietnam. <laughs> and, and at trial throughout, he insisted that he was standing up for the Constitution and the rule of law. He put the war on trial. The peace movement, he said, was standing up for the rule of law while high government officials were complicit in an undeclared war and criminal atrocities against civilians. So the law student who graduated last in Chicago graduated first in his trial in Boston. Um, <laughs> During that trial, Dad got a telegram, which for you kids is kind of like an email, but they bring it to your door. Uh, he, he got a telegram from Reverend Martin Luther King saying to him, if you are guilty, then I am guilty too. And indeed, Dad was making the same argument about the war that Dr. King was making about segregation. It was the government policy that was outside the law, and it was morally and legally necessary to challenge it. And those who did were citizens guilty of nothing. Like Dr. King, my dad was a great citizen of democracy who insisted the purpose of government must be justice. Dad quoted St. Augustine at trial to say that a state which does not pursue justice is no more than a band of thieves, a reference that the judge quickly ordered immediately stricken from the record and disregarded by the jury, along with the Geneva Conventions, which he also said should be disregarded. So I think, the jury saw a man of integrity with three children who did not want to go to jail at all, but who was so anguished by the violence taking place in his name that he was willing to risk everything to stop it. It could have been a moment like the trial of Socrates where an intellectual had to accept the consequences of corrupting the youth of his time, but dad convinced everyone that the threat to the law and the threat of corruption to the youth came not from the intellectuals, but from the state. And the jury recognized him as a patriot who stood ready at every moment to defend his country against his government. The Vietnam War ended on dad's birthday, April 30th in 1975, and that is the day we hope to give the Marcus Raskin Award for Civil and Intellectual Courage you're about to hear about. <laughs> Lesson seven, there's just a couple more. Act pragmatically, not in the degraded sense of doing whatever powerful people want you to do, but in the Deweyan sense of promoting experiments to advance the ideals of freedom and the common good. Dad's hero, John Dewey, said, theory without practice is empty, but practice without theory is blind. Dad was a man of strong action and high theory who always sought to bring the two together. He rejected all ideological systems, including both bureaucratic state socialism and bureaucratic state capitalism. He rejected government secrecy, lies, and deception as a threat to the foundations of democracy. Democracy and its operating principle, the rule of law, he wrote, need a ground to stand on, and that ground is the truth. He debunked the fraudulent claims of market fundamentalism, eugenics, and all the authoritarian ideologies of the right. He rejected completely the pseudo-scientific claims of Marxism about the iron laws of history and dialectical materialism, embracing instead the vision of radical human freedom associated with existentialism and his beloved Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. But dad knew that pragmatism needs to have a moral content lest it becomes a Machiavellian formula the way some people do use it in our town. His friend Sidney Morgan Besser once put it this way, pragmatism works in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. Uh, <laughs> dad showed us pragmatism works in practice when you create projects that are imbued with ideals and purpose. He called this process social reconstruction, and the great proof of it was the work of the civil rights movement and his friends at SNCC who came to IPS, including Ivan O. Donaldson, Bob Moses, Marion Berry, Sue Thrasher, Heather Booth, Cortland Cox, and Frank Smith. 
These young people transform the South, and they transformed America, not through war or violent revolution, but by rebuilding society, drawing on what is best in it, and overcoming oppressive and pathological arrangements. You can find in this pragmatic public philosophy, if you're willing to wade through my dad's books, uh, you can find in it the very best of liberalism, radicalism, progressivism, and conservatism all mixed together. Lesson eight, never give up on anyone, never hate anyone, and act with love whenever you can. Marcus Raskin was a man touched by many forms of genius, musical, philosophical, political, but arguably his greatest genius of all was identified by the historian Gary Wills who wrote of him that my dad had a genius for affection. And everyone present here today at Six and I has experienced the transforming force of my dad's affection. But the most astounding sign of his genius was seen not with respect to his treatment of his friends and his family, but with respect to his treatment of his adversaries and the people he didn't know. He never gave up on anyone. He never prejudged anyone. He never hated anyone, and he gave every single person the benefit of the doubt. I never heard him utter a disparaging word of a single person, and that includes Richard Nixon, who put him on his enemies list, Barry Goldwater, who tried to get him fired, and Ramsey Clark, the attorney general, who prosecuted and indicted him. My dad had no time to waste on ad hominem politics and not an ounce of negative energy. I once asked him whether he could think of a reason really to love your enemy. And he said, your enemy teaches you to take strong action. You could see dad's remarkable and radiant humanism in the most mundane interactions. I remember one like it was yesterday. I was in high school and I went to meet dad at the old IPS in the building across the street. And it was not long after the assassination of Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Karp and Moffat, his beloved colleagues, which shook everyone in the core. And we were waiting for the elevator, and we got in the elevator, and there was a guy in there who looked like a hell's angel. He had tattoos all over him, he weighed certainly more than 300 pounds, and it was just the three of us, and you know my dad talked to everybody, and I was mortified when we got in that elevator. Um, and I just said to myself, please, 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 don't let him not talk to him. But sure enough, my dad said, Where'd you get all those tattoos? <laughs> and so I'm thinking, we're dead. We are dead now. Uh, and, and the man said in a southern draw, North Carolina. And I, as I prayed for silence, I heard my dad say, are you happy you got all those tattoos? <laughs> and oh my god, I'm thinking, it's all over. We're, we're dead. It's all over. And then <laughs> it's the world's slowest elevator, too. And then, and then the man says, well, not really too happy because I was 19 in the army when I got them. But now my daughter's 19 and she wants to get tattoos and I can't really stop her because she says I got them. And my dad said, well, you know what? I think they look great on you and I think you should let your daughter get her tattoos. She probably just wants to be like her dad. And then the elevator door opened and I looked up and I saw the man get out and I heard him say, thanks, partner. And that was it. And so this leads me to... <laughs> this leads me to my last lesson, okay? And my lesson nine is no good act in life is ever wasted. And I am loath to close this beautiful ceremony, um, but I do want to tell you this story because I will treasure it the rest of my life. Um, and like so many of the other stories about my dad, it borders on magical realism. You know, it's something that's almost too exquisite to be true, but these things happened, you know? Um, so it was the broiling summer of 2006. It was my first campaign for the state senate. And I, you know, I've had some tough campaigns that many of you have helped me on, and I appreciate that. But this one was in a class by itself. I was running against a 32-year incumbent who was the president pro tem of the Maryland Senate. And I'd been trying all summer to get my dad to come out and knock on doors with me. And he finally relented in the dog days of August. And I knew I was going to have issues with him. So I, I set him up with a group of interns from our Democracy Summer program, and I said, Dad, you're going to take, uh, you start on this side of the block, and I'm going to go down that side of the block, and we'll just meet in the middle. He said, fine. And I said, but the one thing to remember is that some people have my sign up, and some people have my opponent sign up, and if they do, skip those houses. Just go to the ones that don't have a sign up, because we're looking for the undecided people. 
And so he said, okay, in that way that suggested he had no intention of following what I was saying. And so I took off towards the end of block with my team, and then he was there with uh, his team, and I vaguely out of the corner of my eye saw him go to that first house, which actually had uh, a sign for my opponent, Ida Rubin, and I said, all right, whatever. So uh, we go and we start marching down the block, and about a half an hour, 40 minutes later, we're in the middle of the block. My dad's nowhere to be found. We keep going, we keep going, we still don't see him anywhere. Finally, it's the last two or three houses. He's still on the corner talking to the one person who had the Ida Rubin sign on the block, okay? And so I'm getting a little irritated. And, um, and it's like 95 degrees, and so I'm about to walk over to see what's happening, and then one of the interns comes running to me, and, and I said, what's going on, what's happening? And he said, look, well, they're coming down the pathway, and the man takes a Jamie Raskin presented sign, puts it up right next to the other one, then he takes that sign, and he turns it upside down, and plants it back into the, into the ground. And, and so I, I'm like, what is going on? He said, well, your dad, starts talking to him. He's a professor of mathematics at the University of Maryland. They start talking about Bertrand Russell. They start talking about Einstein. He's read one of your dad's books. They're going on and on. So finally, your dad says to him, well, will you put up one of my son's signs? And he said, well, I'd like to, but I was in synagogue, and somebody asked me to put up an Ida Rubin sign. And my dad said, did you promise not to put up one of Jamie's signs? And he said, no, actually, didn't come to think of it, I didn't. He said, well, let's put one of those up. So he put it up, and then, and then, my dad said to him, did you promise to put up the Ida Rubin side right way up or... And sure enough, and I said, no, I didn't promise that. He turned it upside down. We've got a photograph of this, okay? This actually happened. Um, so... <laughs> um, I just want to say, I know... My dad has gotten me thousands of votes in my life, but this is the most special one. It was the only one he really worked for. It was the only door he ever knocked with me. And it is, to me, the quintessential Marcus Raskin story, story because it says it all. And I'm going to say it to you. You be the hope, and you be the light. Spoil your children with love. Bring your intelligence and ethics with you wherever you go. Work for peace and justice. Be a pragmatic idealist. Never give up on anyone in any circumstance. Don't be afraid to talk to the person you think might be your enemy. Always keep fighting, and no good act is ever wasted. Generations to come will marvel that such a man was with us. And, and we had him for 83 years. On behalf of the Raskin family, I want to say thank you for being the hope for us today. and Mark's wife. I'd like to introduce who we call lovingly, our lovingly older daughter, Erica Raskin Littlewood. Oh, sorry. Erica Raskin Littlewood, a fine novelist. And younger daughter, Eden Raskin Jenkins. We are all so delighted and pleased and honored and moved that all of you have come here to celebrate Mark's life. We have lost Marcus, but we hope to continue his legacy. Several years ago, an anonymous donor gave a generous seed grant to create the Marcus Raskin Freedom Fund. In memory of Mark, a beloved colleague has also made a significant contribution. The Raskin family and the Institute for Policy Studies are committed to growing the fund to support new, two new important projects. The first would be to fund one or more Marcus Raskin Next Leader interns at IPS. Mark nurtured the intern program and mentored hundreds of them over the years. 
Recently, IPS has committed to fund stipends to attract talent from a more diverse background of applicants and to further enrich the program. The second endeavor we wish to fund is the Marcus Raskin Award for Civil and Intellectual Courage. Beginning in 2019, an award will be given in April of each year to honor a progressive whose acts of civic engagement, intellectual leadership, and political bravery in the service of peace and social reconstruction best exemplify Mark's spirit. All memorial donations have already been added to this fund. Raising an additional 75,000 will allow us to sustain these two new programs indefinitely. Contributions of any and all sizes are gratefully accepted and all donations will help. You'll find information on the back of your memorial brochure or on the Institute for Policy Studies website for the Raskin Freedom Fund. Thank you so much for joining us today and being part of the progressive spirit that inspired Mark's drive and commitment. Through you, his legacy will remain alive. <laughs>